All right, great. I'm going to turn things over to Sandy Newell. Thank you very much, Melissa. Uh, we will start our session off with the roll call. And this is where I also check to see who actually has I can speak or whether you would be using chat 100%. So Gretchen, I uh, would like to actually have you, each person, say your name, the name of the library, the city, since folks know more of where cities are than counties, and the length in your job. And so um, Gretchen would like to start with you. Okay. Melissa is thinking that you don't have a microphone. If you don't, go ahead and put that information into chat uh, so folks can hear a little bit more about you. And she says, um, Gretchen Debris, Florida, Florida B. Thompson Library, Clewiston, three years. Okay, thanks, Gretchen. Uh, Jennifer, next. I'm doing alphabetical by your first name. Okay, it looks like Jennifer um, doesn't have a mic. And she's typed into chat also. She says, Jennifer Silas, Martin County Library System, Stewart, 13 years in the system, three years as director. Thank you, Jennifer. Karen. Yeah, hi, this is Karen. I'm from Lake Park in Palm Beach County. I've been director, <laughs> oh gee, um, it's been about a little over five years, I guess, and I've been with this particular library for about 12 years. Thank you, Karen. Now let's go to Maria. Go ahead, Maria. Okay. Hi. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. This is Maria Shanique from Highlands County. Uh, I've been in the system for 13 years, and I've been the lead librarian for approximately three years. And Highlands County is Sebring. Uh, yes. Right, right. Yes, yes. Yeah. Monica. This is Monica Knapp. I am at the Helen Hoffman Plantation Library, which is just west of Fort Lauderdale in Broward County, and I have been director for 11 years. Thank you, Monica. Now let's go up to the panhandle. Renee. This is Renee. I am director of the Washington County Public Library System, and this July will be four years, actually. Shocking. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Um, it flew by. Time does. It's Chipley, Florida. Um, Sabrina. Let's see if, if again we're trying the talking here. Are you if you can't have a mic, you can type in. And I think um, Pat Gillian just arrived, so I'll back up and have her introduce yourself. I think, Pat, you, if you have a microphone, we're doing name, name of library, city, length, and job. So you can either uh, via microphone or put in chat. And then you just popped in. I'm not going to introduce myself. Well, I could. I'm Sandy Newell, if you didn't know. Um, Susan. No, no. Um, Susan doesn't have her audio connected yet. But we do have Cynthia Cobb from Riviera Beach Public Library and director. Okay, great. Thanks, Cynthia. Glad to chat. Maybe you can collect people's things on planning. Um, let's see who else we need here. Uh, Susie? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, this is Subi, and I am in Palm Springs, which is in the middle of Palm Beach County. And I was just looking at how long I've been here. It's like one year and almost five months. Ooh, almost a year. <laughs> <laughs> almost a year and a half. <laughs> okay. Um, Tanya. Tanya Williams, Collier County Public. Uh, yeah, Collier County Public <laughs> Library System, and I've been with. The library 21 years but six months as director <laughs> thank you Tanya did we miss anybody here Susan um, Sabrina um, oh, Pearson Clueist in public library 12 years cataloging and whatever else needs to be done <laughs> thanks Sabrina 
Anybody else we're missing? All right. Um, many of you have been on these calls before. Um, it's really to be a discussion. We are having a theme for each, but we don't need to stick to the theme at all. And uh, so uh, the theme this, this um, month is around construction, buildings, taking care of facilities, all that kind of stuff that we know you never get in library school. And you might know how to take care of your own home, but it's certainly different when you're in a government building. And so I don't know when this picture of Daytona was, was taken. It's from our Florida memory collection, but it was just sort of an interesting one. We can go to the next page now. So now you're taking a look at the oldest continuously existing library in Florida. It's up here in the panhandle. And you can see it's an 1886 um, building. And it's on a beautiful lake in, in Defuniac Springs, the, the back of the library. So now. Uh, Pat has, uh, Pat Guyland says, Wilderness Coast Public Library, five years. <laughs> Thanks, Pat. All right, we're going to scroll on down on our agenda. So this is, these are some topics that, too far. Yeah, too far. <laughs> and we're not, we're not literally going through these topics. It really is any of these topics, does somebody want to step up and say, oh, I want to talk about this. This is really just to trigger your thinking uh, about your facility. Uh, who wants to step up and if you can speak, you know, out loud, that's fine. If not, go ahead and chat into chat. Oh, that's a good one. I see Suvi. <laughs> Any good tips for pests? And what kind of pests, Suvi? I'm curious. Well, she's typing. We have Sue Kiley um, from Hernando County Public Library Director, eight months. And Subi says, we have had rats and now a bunch of termite wings. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what, what's the advice out there? Who's our pest authority in on this call? Or are your thoughts or comments? And what kind of pests have you had? I remember years ago, the Wakala County Public Library was in the old wooden courthouse, and it made it into library journal because it had bats. <laughs> Somebody want to speak up or give some advice on pests? Uh, Subi is saying that she definitely didn't learn about this in library school. Karen is suggesting she get a snake. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> you have to, what kind of snake, Karen? <laughs> maybe a library cat. Or maybe a li yeah, library cat. That's the. That is the reason library cats first became a thing. Yeah. yeah. Any any other? Not necessarily for the termites, but they do help with the rats. <laughs> I have a cat. He's useless. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you are from you have a, you have a cat at the library in the village. Yeah, he comes in, but he's so lazy and so fast. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, so much for that idea. <laughs> Susan is saying uh, we have had the same in Hornando. Uh, facilities put rat rat traps and termite wings are pest control company sprayed for. Uh, they also have had mice. Uh, not sure if the library cat would like the snake. <laughs> he is useless. <laughs> oh, here's Monica's got one. Um, Monica says, our city has tented our building. We did have a snake in the lobby this morning, a black racer. Oh, those are, those are good. Go eat your rats. <laughs> uh, so you can just get termites sprayed? My question would be, this is Renee, would be, do you have a monthly maintenance contract with some type of pest control service? Because that's what I have to have because, you know, out my back door is your attention pond. Yeah, that's what we do. And Karen, go ahead. You got your hand up. Yeah, we had um, termites on our circulation desk. And you can have that one area just tented, so to speak, instead of the entire building. They still open up the entire building and use the same 
preventative measures, opening all the doors, putting the food away, but they only concentrate on that particular um, item that may have termites, and that's worked pretty well. We haven't had them since. We don't see them anywhere in the building. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And Susan says, so far, so far just spraying has worked for us. Um, suvi has got, uh, I think she says, yes, we just got one. I think she means a monthly contract. Um, and Susan has a monthly contract. Pat has a monthly contract. Um, Suvi, they gave them extra traps. Um, and Cynthia says, monthly pest control service in Riviera Beach. All right. Um, we can still chime in if you, something comes up, but this sounds like a pretty rich uh, discussion, which I didn't think of at all as being, <laughs> but it's very a very important topic to discuss. And Monica says Public Works, Works handles our pest control monthly, um, and Susan says it was no finding, fi finding the dead rats in the traps. <laughs> yeah, right. <sighs> And especially since you've got all those books about the famous rats. <laughs> mm -hmm. And CB is saying the smell of dead rats is awful. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Very interesting. What next would y'all like to talk about is regarding um, facilities? Monica, you've got your hand up? Yeah, I do. I, um, our building was built in 1968, and at that time, patrons weren't plugging things into electric outlets. So I'm wondering if anybody has done anything creative and budget-friendly to create places for people to plug in their own devices without pulling up your carpet and putting wiring in the foundation. Anybody gone through and do that? I know there are what stations, what do you call those things that are charging stations? Charging stations that can handle several. You can do charging stations. I would also say make sure your county uh, maintenance crew or whoever you have access to comes through and tells you what outlets can handle extra loads if you're going to do a charging station. Um, yeah, the other problem is the outlets are always sort of under the stacks against the walls, but that's not where people sit. And we can't have those cords running all over the place without creating a hazard. So we've got now little, you know, strips in every corner. We've got them attached to the bookshelves so they can't wheel them out, you know, into the room or anything. But I, just, I was just wondering if there was anything else out there. Um. Pat says Jefferson has charging stations, and Susan says we have drilled into wooden tables and added plugs there. We just added charging stations, too. Thank you. And have folks done a remodel that different technology, you know, really for just electric, you know, focus? Any folks have done that, and what's the cost, and pros and cons? And Karen, you've got your hand up. I don't know if you wanted to say something about this topic or something else. Yeah. Well, sort of related. I'm wondering if anybody um, has gone ahead for their particular library, um, gotten electrical contractors. How do you go about doing that? Do you have to go out to bid? Do you have your public works do it? Or, um, yeah, I'm just kind of curious because we, we want to have quite a bit of that type of work done in the future and um, I'm just wondering, it's not something, this is the first time our public works department, um, it's not something that they would do on that scale, so. Well, this is Monica and Plantation. We have as part of our building department a designing construction manager, so anytime we would take on a project that size, he would handle the whole the whole thing, putting it out to bid and finding the contractor and managing the project. Cool. Great, thanks. Any other input on, on that? I was very curious to hear about that as well because we have um, our, we have electricians here in the village but the whole building is like jerry-rigged. There's like all kinds of wires everywhere and in the walls, and they don't even know what, what they are. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, 
it's uh, kind of a mess. We simply don't have the staff in our department to do it. Our town has minimal staff in all the departments, not just the library. So if we want something, you know, really involved done, it's not something that they're capable of doing because of the size of the department as well. And, and that's part of the reason why we need to look elsewhere. And Susan says, we have our facilities slash maintenance director handle that type of project, bid, et cetera. The interesting part about the Defunac Springs Library is they did expand out the back, but it's been a long time back, really, before you needed the kinds of plugs you need today. I'm sure they upgraded their electrical from 1886, but <laughs> uh, not in the same kind of way you might do it in, in today's world. Maria is saying, Facilities Department works on most of the electrical. New AC units are installed by a company. And Suvi is saying, I guess I need building contractor slash electrician degrees and certifications too. <laughs> Go for it, Suvi. <laughs> yep. Just let us know when you get those so we can, like, send you around the state assisting. Yeah, the librarian electrician. There you go, Suvi. <laughs> There's a niche market. <laughs> Different kind of combination. What else? <laughs> Are any of you doing any realigning of your spaces? You know, I know the whole trend, of course, a lot of folks are looking at quiet rooms, and that's been out for a while. Does anybody have a quiet room? Maybe um, you could raise your hand if you do, just to know that. Why don't you raise your hand if you have a, happen to have a quiet room? I know a lot of you are smaller libraries, but Pat says we do. That's good. Anybody else? It's hard when we have small spaces. Renee says they've got two study rooms. Thank you, Renee. Then the other other trend out there is, I'll call it educational spaces, or the, the branding name is Makerspace, but I think it's a lot more than, than that. Uh, it's spaces that people can work together in small groups. Uh, it's the idea that you let you know two people sit at a computer together because they're learning together. There's lots of different ways you can do that. Is anybody taking sort of a look at sort of revamping your space? And we've got a call, to get back to um, the quiet rooms. Susan says, we just have two very small study rooms at one branch. And Subi says, I need to figure out how to redesign the space, but not exactly sure how. Limited space. We started a big weeding project, so hopefully that will help limit some shelving. Yeah, I think that is one of the trends as you're moving getting rid of the collections that aren't circling and then much more in electronic. You don't need as much magazine space as the old days when I was out there as to keep all that background of magazines. All right, Karen, go ahead. There we have um we have the beginnings in in our teen room, a small maker space. And recently our friends have kind of gotten interested in it and gotten some townspeople. So um, while I was hoping it was going to be more for a 3D printer, it looks like they're going to be heading to make it kind of like an audio studio. Hmm. So, um, but it's very small, but it's still it's within the teen room, and that's probably a good space for for a quiet room. <laughs> so <laughs> we may switch things around. I see this, you know, where we're getting ready to reconfigure a lot of the library because in terms of like maker spaces that people work together cooperatively it seems that that's what our computer room is exactly uh, turning out to be uh, a place where you have two people sitting at the computer around homework time particularly so. and I think you're right as far as the concept of the teen room where you want to keep the teens the noise inside the teen room now you want to have a quiet room and the noise can be all over the library <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Go ahead, Subi. You got your hand up. Um, I also need a teen space, and I just have no idea. Like, I mean, I would have to get rid of some so many books, which is kind of um, really hard. But um, 
I mean, we're working on the weeding project, but I wanted to ask if anybody had used um, Better World books and what their experience is, because we have, we have to get rid of a lot of books with the weeding project, and I thought that would be a good, good way to recycle them. Karen, go ahead. Yeah, we have. We've used Better World books. Um, that works good for excess books. Um, but it does take time, and you need to probably um, entrust that to one particular employee. And I find for a small library, you have to really kind of pace it. Otherwise, you end up with a room full of books because you have to go through the process of boxing them, labeling them. And if you're using weeded books, um, they have to be taken out of the system and unmarked. Um, and that's not as fast as they come in, seems like. And you want to say a bit about Better World Books and how that works, um, Karen, since y'all have used it? Yeah, it's um, basically a system. They provide you with the boxes. They'll provide you. Um, they work with UPS. Um, they're online. Uh, you can sign up online. You can scan the books that they're interested in online. Um, and uh, when you're ready to send them out, you uh, create the UPS labels um, online. And UPS just comes and picks them up, which is great. They used to provide tape for the boxes. They don't do that anymore, but um, it's still a very, they make it very easy to, um, to pass on your excess books that the friends aren't using and that, you know, you know aren't going to be sold on site. And every once in a while, they send you a check. I can't say the check is very big. That depends on what it is that you're sending them. But it is a positive way, like I said, to get rid of the excess books and know that they're being you know, put to good use. This is Renee. And of course, I'm in a very small county. Um, but one of the things that we do with our weeding books and everything, well, um, is if it's young adult or children's, I generally call um, our school uh, librarians because I spend in a month what they have for a whole year to spend and see if they want anything first. And then um, actually, you know, we will have a book sale or sometimes we'll just have like a free books cart, you know, I mean, because technically taxpayers paid for it so they can have it if they it's no longer of use to the library. And people love the fact that they can come into the building and just get a free book or a free magazine. That's really cool. Maria says, the Sebring Library has a limited space in the children's area. We have one very small conference room for about 12 people. And Cynthia says, we'll try something this summer with youth volunteers oversight more later. Pat says, we've had a mixed experiences. We don't make much money, but at least the books are out of the building. Uh, Cynthia says, Rivera Beach uses Better World Books. Contact Pat John. Ask in here. Okay, moving on. Um, what next? What would y'all like to talk about? And and also, I do know that at the Florida Library Association conference, the the directors member library group met. Some mm -hmm. of you might, uh, might have attended. In fact, I'm curious. Did anybody attend? If you did, you want to um, uh, raise your hand? I'm just curious to see if anybody attended that meeting. Susan did. Susan. Um, you want to say a little bit about the meeting, what you know, how it went from your perspectives? And I don't remember whether you have a phone or type. Yeah, this is Sue. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, can. That's great. Okay. Well, it wasn't working earlier, but um, I did attend, um, and I found it very helpful for me as a new director just having you know, the support of a member group. Um, and I, we discussed a lot about um, LS and S, how there's a trend toward them um, sort of coming in when they know there's a new director or, or a long-term director retiring. Um, so uh, that was very helpful for me to be able to talk to other people that um, have gone through that before because it's, may be a possibility here. I haven't heard anything more since I've gotten back, but um, 
And we also discussed uh, the possibility of um, a certification of standards. Um, and I think a, an ad hoc committee was started to work on that, too. And Maria says, Boys and Girls Club and RCMA also may take uh, board-approved surplus materials. Yeah, um, on the member group, I'm Andrew Biedenbaugh, who is the director of uh, Tampa, uh, is now the head of the, the member group. <clears throat> and I think there was some talk, too, about getting closer connected with the legislative um, FLA's the Legislative Committee. Other, other topics, and again, we don't have to stay at all with, with space. What are some of the things, um, opportunities you're grabbing or challenges, challenges you're handling? Throw these out, throw it out to the group to share and talk. <clears throat> oh, well, this, this is Sue Piley from Hernando again. Um, one of the things that we're going through here uh, right now with our budget process is they are not um, allowing us to put in any capital. So th thankfully, we uh, for state aid, we're funding our all of our materials with state aid. But we have some very old buildings. We have an AC unit that's almost 30 years old. So th all of these items we keep putting them in, a bu in the budget and they keep cutting them out. Um, between working with our facilities and what we can uh, fund, we have a roof that needs to be replaced, two ACs that need to be replaced, and these are things that they just keep taking out of the facilities budget. I'm just wondering if any other, any other libraries are experiencing the same sort of issues with just trying to keep up your branches. I hate to say this, this is Renee, but normally, like, you're, I mean, I don't know, I never get money for this kind of thing. You know, what will happen is my air conditioner will just completely die, and then there'll be some type of emergency meeting, and more than likely, it will come out of general revenues contingency fund. I mean, you can put it in every time. Mm -hmm. They're just not thinking that far ahead. I mean... They would like to say that they're thinking that far ahead, but you're just, I hate to tell you, you're just not a priority. I mean, like, and yeah. it can be very disheartening um, because you're, you know, librarians, I think, by nature, we tend to be planners, um, but there's just, there's no way around it. So, but, you know, keep putting it in every year, and then when, what happens is, They'll be like, oh, why didn't you tell us this? You can be like, well, here are the last five years' budgets where you decided to cut my facilities. Not that they want to be, like, you know, scolded mm -hmm. on it, but it's a good thing to remind them that, yeah, you were trying to help them out. It's not your fault that suddenly okay. they have a $50,000 expense they weren't budgeting for. Mm -hmm. So, Thank you. At least I know it's not just, it's not just here. <laughs> and Pat says we end up with the same yeah. scenarios that Renee does. Mm-hmm. Same here. Um, and Gretchen says, how do you determine the maximum amount of people that can be in your library at any one time? Hmm. Interesting. I know elevators now, but they posted on Fire code, right? Yeah, Pat says fire code. And Suvi, you've got your hand up? Um, mine was about the previous um, comment. I have like the opposite problem almost. It's like they want to update the library building. They want new AC system. You know, we were we would have been satisfied with something more simpler, just you know, changing the units that aren't working. But they want to do a whole entire new system. And this process started like over a year ago with like some engineers coming to look at everything. And I still have no idea 
when anything's going to happen. And now we're really afraid that, you know, if the few working units that are working are going to go, then we're really going to be very hot. Patrons, books, staff. Um, so I have like the opposite. And then, but when it comes to like library programs or services, things that are not that expensive or especially adding, you know, a librarian position like for adult services, that's like completely unrealistic. You know, I shouldn't be asking for that, but I can get, you know, this giant um, new chiller system, which is going to cost a lot. And I, I don't know, it's just like, it doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> interesting perspective there that there that it's the lack of yeah you know, they like all the the fancy electronic stuff mm, this is renee um cv something that may have happened higher up the food chain than either of us um it could be that it, i do know that there are companies that go around and sell to counties and municipalities how they're going to save their energy costs and so basically they're like, oh, we'll do an evaluation and they sign a contract and then the county ends up taking on a bunch of debt and then everybody gets like climate control kind of thing or whatever. So you might want to investigate and see if that's the reason why um, they're wanting to do this thing or whatever. They may have signed a contract stating that they would upgrade to a certain level all of their facilities. I, I know that that was one of the reasons why they wanted to get the new system is to save um, in the long run. And Sydney also said they want me to update the building, but, they, but not to do any programs. Um, and Karen... Because I can't offer any computer classes or yeah. you know, do anything if I don't have any adult services staff. And that's really the challenge to try and convince that to the powers that be. They want the programs, but when you tell them you need people to do that, that that's the bulk of library services, I find that's the biggest challenge. That uh, time and time again, uh, solid things, books, I've been told books, yes, people know. I'm like, yeah, the books, you got to have the process. You got to be able to promote the books, otherwise they're, they're worthless on the shelves. But yeah, I find that's the biggest problem. You say people, and they look at the total amount, and it's true. Personnel is the most expensive part of our budget to a large degree. I mean, outside of construction costs. I mean, that's it for me. I don't know if anybody else finds it different. City so says we are a blockbuster to them. No skilled personnel needed. Uh, Pat says it's also a reoccurring cost. That's true. Yeah, that's reoccurring. And involves benefits, says Pat. And two, it goes beyond even just recurring benefits is that when you have cost of living increases, you have raises, you have vacation time, yeah, it can get expensive. But from the library perspective, from our perspective, it's, it's well worth the cost. You get um, a lot of return on that. And Susan says, yes, increased services, but no increases in staff. New personnel requests do not get approved, but I keep trying. And Judy says, "All we'll put in every year." So, any thoughts or comments on the budgeting you know, process now? Looking forward to October one. Pat is saying, "Showing big increases in stats helps with justification." Yeah, I guess programming numbers if you had. Well, if you just look at like circulation numbers for like the last five years and programming for the last five years, if you've seen an increase but you haven't had a staff increase, that could be a good justification. It's a hard case to make. That's why my boss doesn't want any programs. <laughs> so, I, so there's no justification to get staff. <laughs> The odd stuff with us is that they want to increase hours at the library. We're already up in the 50s. They'd like to see it go up to 60, 
But again, you need bodies. You need at least two to three people in the library at any time. And that's that sometimes gives them pause for, well, okay, we'll consider that. <laughs> but actually seeing that come down the pike and going through the actual hiring process, um, that's that's another obstacle to get over. Uh, Cynthia is saying that they've started new initiatives with AARP volunteers. After about a year, it helps to justify the new position for them. I'd love to. Uh, Susan uh, is saying, does anyone have... Defibrillators. Defibrillators. Uh, we are being told that we need to include them in our budget as, we, as well as training for all staff. Uh, Maria at Sebring and Highlands is requesting a countywide technical services position for the next fiscal year. And Karen is saying that they do have defibrillators. What kind of staff training is done for uh, for staff with the defibrillators? Does the library do it? Or does the county, city do it? And Pat has them too. Karen, go ahead. Yeah, all, all of our staff is trained uh, in the town for uh, def defibrillators and uh, CPR, but the defibrillators themselves are, anybody could use them. Once you take them off and open them up, they begin to talk you through the process. Mm -hmm. So they're very easy to use. We only check them once a year to make sure that the defibrillators are working and the batteries are, are fresh. And uh, I think our fire extinguisher company has been doing them this past year. Pat says the county provides training and um, Suvi says I had defibrillators in the county libraries but I think we can get away with it now because the police and fire are next door and have them. Um, Maria says for our defibs EMS staff trained the library staff. And this is Renee, and you can always get with your EMS department or your even your emergency management, and they can tell you the best vendor that's like maybe on a state master contract or whichever will get you like the best deal because they are very pricey. Good questions. What other comments, things? would you like to bring up this afternoon? I'd be curious if, for those of you who attended the Florida Library Association conference, what were some of the ahas or, or oh my gods that you heard when you uh, went to the conference, which was a couple weeks ago? Well, um, our next our next call like this is June fifteenth. Uh, it's at ten o'clock Eastern time, and the theme of that will be working with library supporters. So you know that's the the next one that you can sign up for, and that's those are the monthly ones we've got scheduled so far. We will start signing scheduling some meetings um, like this in the future. And any thoughts or suggestions on how we can make it, you know, more effective? And just in general, these discussions, but other work that we do, uh, we'll be starting to plan the 2018 Public Library Academy. And any any suggestions that you would make uh, would be helpful. The new director's orientation is October 17th. The uh, Director's meeting is the 18th and 19th, so you can go ahead and put that on your calendar. So he says this is a great opportunity, even if it's scheduled, new issues might come up. And we've got some links that we'll be pushing out that relate to facilities, and um, that, you know, depending on what you want to what you want to tap into, there's a web junction one. There's a Public Library Association, Managing Facilities for Results, there's some worksheets in there. 
the uh, PLA's uh, results series has been out for a good while, so I didn't look to see how how current some of this was, but just to pull together so that we'll yeah, yeah. Anybody else want to bring up a topic? Are you the, um, sending the links in a follow-up email too? We can, yeah, we can do that too. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I think you can also download this script, I think, the chat. I'm looking at Brendan now. <laughs> but we'll send it out. I mean, we'll make it easy for sure. We're at 2.41. You know, we'll stay on, but what we can do is say the actual official meeting is over, but Brendan, Melissa, and I will stay on to see if there's any other questions. Goodbye, Renee. <laughs>